Hi, everybody. We're having, again, Reverend, Reverend Clenard Childress, and we're, it is our pleasure to have him. And I will read this whole thing because I don't want to miss anything. So, yes, it's beautiful. It, um, in spring of 2003, Reverend Childress birthed the website blackgenocide.org to primarily reach the African-American community on the genocidal effects of abortion. In March of 2006, Reverend Clenard H. Childress authored his first book, No Shepherd's Cry. Pastor Childress and his book were featured on the 700 Club, hosted by TVN's Pat Robertson. In 2007, Reverend Childress produced the website Abomination to respectfully oppose the candidacy of Obama due to his partnership with Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry. In December of 2010, Pastor Clenard Childress began clergy, clergy for Better Choices in New York City based clergy information network, partnering with Life Always, a pro-life group in Houston, Texas, a billboard posted in Soho, Manhattan. In February of 2011, Manhattan, Manhattan with saying created by Reverend Childress, the most dangerous place for an African-American is to be in the, the womb of his African-American mother, helped raise the awareness of the clergy network and reach a broader base of pastors and social activists. In February of 2015, LEARN, L-E-A-R-N, Northeast and Center for Bioethical Reform launched the All Black Life Matters project. The Black Life Matters mantra has created the catalyst for the con conversation we have been looking to elevate since our inception. This project has proven to be an extremely productive means to open the eyes of the public to the detriment of abortion. December 2nd, 2017, the Life Education and Resource Network, in recognition of the lifetime commitment to raise awareness to halt genocide, by standing spiritually strong in the midst of social and political changes, your fellow issue-driven brothers and sisters in Christ present you with the Irma Flarty Craven Award. December 15 of 2017, PBS Frontline produced the documentary Anti-Abortion Crusaders Inside the African-American Abortion Battle, where Reverend Childress was highly featured. This was a breakthrough documentary produced by the public broadcasting system. Pastor Childress Jr. has repeatedly fe been re featured in the World Magazine and contributed commentary and editorials for Christian Christianity Today, The Christian Post, Black Christian News, The Washington Times, and New Jersey Star-Ledger, and is a regular columnist on Alan P's Renew America. Pastor Childress is joyously married to Regina Childress and has four children, Clenard, Thomas, Tonya, and Tia. Welcome, Reverend. We're so happy that you're here again. So I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, needless to say, it was always great to be here, to be able to fellowship and to share. Um, as I stated earlier, we're going to come from a uh, scriptural perspective here something that is undoubtedly needed once again in the church to remember the calling and the election that God gave us and that we would not be deceived by doctrines and false teachings and basically uh, secular and humanistic ideas that we're bringing into the church, which is really not the gospel. Now, this was given to me by the Lord uh, in a time of meditation and I uh, spent some time because it appeared to me he wanted me to present this uh, to the church and I wanted to be able to uh, first meditate upon it and think upon it before I began to share it, which I had. And I thought no better place today <laughs> than to share it here and with this audience. And remember that God is doing a new thing with the church right now, but it also means that he is going to resurrect the things that we have lost. Um, the apostle said, uh, basically, we have to redeem the time because the days are evil. I think you know the days are evil. 
But what did he mean by redeeming the time? He said, get back what you've lost over time. Uh, and that is the heart, the spirit, the, uh, the willingness to engage in the house, uh, house of God, uh, the kingdom of God. And we somewhat have let the generation that's coming up behind us, there is such a, a, a gap and a uh, basically a, a, a looseness between the bond of the two. And so our churches have been impacted by that. So this is like a little story <laughs> I'm going to give to you. It is all from the scriptures. Just remember right now, you know, if you're watching this with somebody or whatever, just say, we're going somewhere. You won't understand where I'm going until the end. Okay. The very end. All right. <laughs> you may, and I doubt if you guess it because uh, it was really something that uh, that was a blessing to me and I saw the heart of God in it and we're supposed to communicate the heart of God. Now I'm taking excerpts. I'm not going to uh, be lengthy in any place. We could spend time in a lot of these scriptures I'm going to share, but it's at the end you're going to understand why I made mention of all of these things together as the heart of God himself as he's uh, asking his church to represent him in these latter days. Now, the title of this is God Remembers, God Asks Questions. Okay? God Remembers and God Asks Questions. Now, immediately, you should say, that, well, that's an oxymoron. <laughs> All right? Uh, because basically, God is omniscient and knows everything. So there's need, no need for God to ask questions and there's no need for him to remember because he doesn't forget anything <laughs> only what he chooses to forget and that's our sin so because of that we then have to understand that when god mentioned these things he was empathizing with us he was empathizing with us knowing that he was speaking to a people that are uh, basically inferior to his vastness, his omnipotence being all powerful and almighty. And so he says, I want to empathize with you and I'll use your language and I'm going to speak to you through your weakness. And when you get to this point, at this point of the journey in my age, I realize memory is precious. <laughs> okay. And also I realize that sometimes we ask questions we don't ask enough questions as we grow older. But nevertheless, that's the title of this. God remembers and God asks questions. Now it says in the scriptures, it said, God remembered Noah. This message was basically to challenge the culture. God, Jesus says, in the last days shall be uh, as the days of Lot and as the days of Noah. But the Bible says Noah was found righteous, which means we are all in need of the righteousness of God that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our righteousness. And so Noah was found righteous and he went into a very trying experience with God. Okay. Now, this is a God, this is a person who God says he remembers, all right? And that's going to be in Genesis 8 and 1, but it's going to have to be after an ordeal. And I'll explain that in just a second. He was called, basically, indeed, to preserve. That's what salt and light does. Salt is a preserving agent. And God has called us to be as Noah in this age. And he's called us to truly begin to share the message of life that he has given to us. Now, as you well know the story, he for 120 years preached and nailed, preached and nailed, and he was building an ark to preserve. And at the end of that building of the ark, he entered into that ark because the first time on the earth, it was going to rain, but that rain was judgment. And judgment is something that indeed uh, is something that we don't like to talk about, but it's certainly certain when the imagination of man is continually evil and that we man's inhumanity to man begins to rise above the level in which God intends. So he went into the ark, Noah. 
He went into that ark obeying God. Okay. But it wasn't the greatest of situations. Okay. He went into the ark and he's going to be quarantined for about as long as we've been quarantined <laughs> since March. Basically, it was for 150 days. He'd be spending his time in that ark. Okay. Now, we may not ever think about this, but Noah had the responsibility of caring for all the animals that was in there. Noah and his family. So in other words, Noah had to clean up mess every day. So does the church. <laughs> and so do we. <laughs> we have to deal with issues that we may not be too pleasant to us. It was a safe place, but no doubt it was a stinking place also. And we have to remember that's our mission. There was no HBO. There was no Cinemax. There was no sports channel. There was no Nickelodeon. There was nothing. It was them, family, and animals, all right? So needless to say, Noah had to demonstrate patience to the nth degree. And we know that staying in a sequestered place for that length of time, there's no doubt with family, can be very stressful. <laughs> it can be very testing. But Noah went through that. While Noah was going through that, he was dealing with the fact that the matter is that wondering, is God really in this? Because you have to understand, from the time he entered into the ark, there is nothing that suggests that God said anything to him afterwards. When we're in trials, when we're in tribulation, when we're in difficulties, often God seems that he has forgotten us. And he's not communicating to us his instructions, his next instructions. We're cleaning up mess every day. There really isn't a, a situation and the circumstances where we can really feel relaxed about life because of the stress that we're going through. It's very difficult sometimes to get along with the people that we've been called to get along with on this project or in this church or on this particular assignment. But nevertheless, God is there. And then you hear this. It says, Genesis 8 and 1, God remembers Noah. Now, remember, we said God cannot forget. So why is he having the prophets write this way? He was basically saying Noah felt that God had forgotten him. So he says God remembered Noah. And if you're anybody long enough here on this earth, there'll be those times in doing God's service, doing exactly what God said for you to do, you will feel that God has forgotten. But we know there's a day, a point of time, as it was for Noah, so shall it be for us, that it will definitely appear to be that God remembers and brings his promise to fruition. Let's move on quickly. Then it says, you know the story of Rachel. It also says, God remembered Rachel. All right, well, what is the situation with Rachel? Rachel felt that she was barren and basically felt that God had forgotten her. But here we see in this particular story, and just to center in on this part, you have two women trying to live in under the same household. Because basically, indeed, that's what Jacob, more or less, because of the drunkenness of his wedding night, more or less, the custom of the time was for his, for the older daughter to be married first. And so what Levin did, he just gave uh, Jacob both of his daughters. Okay, but here's my point. Just stay with me. You have two women living in the same household and one is able to become pregnant, and the other one is not able to become pregnant. And this is what brought Rachel great, great grief. But there's another story, and that's this story. The Bible says Jacob loved Rachel. Jacob loved Rachel. Why, are you, why am I emphasizing that? Well, it says this. When Leah, more or less, that was the other sister, basically had her first son, 
she said, God has looked upon my affliction. Why did Leah say that? It's because Jacob loved Rachel that he could never really have great affinity for Leah. And Leah basically realized this and felt that a son would be the answer to the problem. And I say this to the young ladies out there, and I say this to the, the elderly ladies out there, that a child does not make a man love you. And if you want to ask anyone, ask Leah in Genesis. Her first son was Reuben. She said, God has looked upon my affliction, but Jacob never changed. The second one was Simeon, whose name means God has heard my prayer but things never change. Then there was Levi. Now, surely my husband will be joined to me. Surely it did not happen. Uh, and then it got to the point where she had Judah and just said, well, I'm just going to praise God. <laughs> okay. And that's just has to, how it has to be. Leah felt by having his children that that would mean he would love her. But the scripture says, Jacob loved Rachel. Now let's get back to Rachel. What's going on? You have two women, I said, in the same household. So what's going on roughly five to six times in that household? You have Leah basically pregnant for around nine months, walking around that household, causing Rachel much grief. Rachel is grieved because this is exactly what she wants. And she has to watch Leah through Reuben, <laughs> through uh, Simeon, through Levi, through Judah. Basically, she wanted to have the position that Leah had because she wanted to be fulfilled by having that child. All right. Now, Rachel is going through anguish. And no doubt, Leah was making it quite difficult for her. You know, she probably would hold her stomach <laughs> while Rachel was in the room. She would probably comment on the child that is yet to be born. She would probably do so many other things to communicate to Rachel, I am pregnant and you're not. And so here it is. Rachel basically goes through this once again, through Reuben, through Simeon, through Levi, <laughs> again, <laughs> through Judah. And she, this is an ongoing thing, it seems like. But then you get to the scripture. God remembered Rachel. God remembered Rachel. And as you well know, Rachel bore I believe that was Joseph, yes. <laughs> he bore the child. And certainly, uh, it was, um, oh, <laughs> I may be corrected on that, but basically, Rachel, Rachel basically was heard. And it says, God remembered Rachel. God remembered Rachel. And more or less, he was saying, I didn't ever forget her, but to make you understand, indeed, that I understand that you feel forgotten. Now, you understand God never remedies more or less the time between, but he keeps his promise and understands that you feel that you're forgotten. Okay. Now, I'm, just remember, keep saying to yourself, I'm going somewhere. We're not there yet but we're going to get there. Okay. Then 1 Samuel, there was the story of, uh, of Hannah. Okay. And Hannah was much like Rachel. She was attempting to have a child, but could not and did not. And there were other maidens that were there. And that was as the custom was in that day, more or less, that were undoubtedly having children and therefore she was feeling once again barren and forgotten. Women coming to the church in bitterness over barrenness because of something, because of barrenness. 
And so often, and I'll take that a little deeper, Hannah did not have the child, but Hannah desired the child and therefore was coming into the sanctuary regularly with her husband, Elkanah, but she was coming in bitter. But I say to you today, there is many women coming into our churches who are going through postpartum because of abortion. There are many women sitting in our pews who are bitter, who are barren, and who are depressed over that experience. Now, Hannah is in that position because she was being mocked. Elkanah says to her, am I not better to you than 10 husbands? But once again, the desire of her own heart to bear was something that even he and all of his kindness and all of his love for her could not overcome. And so she more or less was not, the story would, would lend to us, had issues with uh, her husband, she had issues with God. So once again, let me just get to the story. So, so Hannah is weeping in the sanctuary, just as many of our women are weeping in the sanctuary silently, depressed silently, trying to do the best they can silently because there's a barrenness. But in many cases, there's a postpartum because there should have been a child and there was not. Let me share this with you very quickly. In John 21, it says, A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. Okay? But soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish. So more or less, John, first chapter, 21st verse, says, A woman, when she is in travail, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish. Well, what if the child is not delivered? What if the child is aborted? Then what is left is just the anguish. Because the child makes you forget the nine months and the travail and all of the anguish. But when there's nothing there, then there is barrenness and it brings a sorrow. And the scripture teaches us that and shares that with us. But let us get back. Hannah is right now barren. She's in the sanctuary crying. And then there's Eli. Now, the problem with Eli, he did not have the gift of discernment. And he thinks Hannah is drunk, just like many pastors who cannot understand the heaviness of the women or the, uh, the uh, how would I say, sometimes cantankerous of women because of a bad experience of abortion. The depression of abortion, it seems like she just can't get along with anybody. It seems like she's so negative about everything. It seems like she's not happy for anybody. And so you think she's just bitter over this, or I don't think many pastors would assume maybe she is drunk or drinking, but Eli cannot discern what's really going on. Hannah is crying and uh, uh, basically is weeping, but it's prayers of intercession. And so Eli thinks he's just not able to, uh, drunk, not able to discern her pain. And so therefore, when he finally realizes what's really going on, he fulfills his priestly office and declares over her that she will have a child and that she will bring forth a son. So once again, 1 Samuel 1 and 119, it says this, God remembers Hannah and she brings forth a son one of the most famous prophets of the Old Testament, Samuel. And she is so grateful out of the relationship <laughs> that she had and bond that she had with God. She lends him unto the Lord. If you know the story, he goes in for four, at the age of four, under the tutelage of Eli to be a prophet in the house of the Lord or to the nation of Israel. And she does have other children after this. But the fact of the matter is that when she has the first up until she had the first, she felt forgotten. 
but it says God remembers Hannah. So we had uh, more or less, we, we saw here, we had Noah, we had Rachel, we had Hannah, and I could do others. The point I'm trying to get to you, I'm getting ready to get, we're, we're just about, we're almost halfway there. <laughs> the point I'm trying to get with you is God remembers. God remembers you. God remembers. Are you ready? Let's go on. What's the title of our lesson? God remembers. God asks questions. Okay. God asks questions. The most famous question in the Old Testament. Adam, where are you? Okay. Now, of course, you got to understand, God already knew where he was. Okay. And God already understood what had happened. But he wants a relationship, so he asks questions. Jesus often asked questions so he could have relationship and have you to think and to bond and to become closer with him. And in this case, knowing that God knows everything, he's asking a question so you would give him the right answer. Well, it didn't happen. Okay. He says, Adam, where are you? And then he says, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hiding over here because, uh, because I'm naked. Now, he's been that way all the time. God then asks another question. Who have you been talking to? Okay. Well, he doesn't choose to answer that because he would be incriminating himself because he knew he had no business talking to the devil. <laughs> All right. So he's asking these questions that he already knows the answer to. Why? I can only think of, uh, unquestionably, it, it reminds me of coming up. Um, and uh, you may not know it. I was a troubled child, especially in <laughs> elementary. But let's say this, mischievous. OK, but what's my point? Now, I, I would really get in trouble at school. And then the principal would call me down to the office and he would say, I'm going to talk to your mother and I'm going to call her. Now, you go on home. OK, so I'm walking home. Knowing there's going to be an inquisition, knowing that I'm going to have to face my mom. Now, I am Adam. All right. <laughs> I'm from the seed of Adam. We all are, right? So as soon as I get to the door, what did you do? Now, she's asking me what I did angrily, so I know she's already talked to the principal. Now, but I'm Adam, right? And I'm going to say, what are you talking about? <laughs> Why? Because I have to see how much she knows of what I did. I'm not going to confess to things openly that I've done. I'd like to see how much she knows. Why? Because I'm a child, I'm still young, and I am of the spirit of Adam. All right. And so are you. And so that's why it takes a relationship with the father, a relationship with God. So here's my point. So anyway, then he asked a question again. Uh, did you eat of the tree? Now, this would have been a great time for confession, just openly admitting, being that God left him in charge, not Eve. He shifts the blame. He says, the woman that thou gavest me. Now, these are all questions God is asking, hoping Adam would have just came clean and would have confessed and probably life would not be the way it is right now if he had it. But if he had just confessed and said, I've fallen, I disobeyed you, I did not do what you had commanded me to do, I, I, I throw myself on your mercy. No, he constantly made excuses and tried to shift the blame. And when God stops asking questions, and his next one question was, what is this that thou hast done? And he was actually directing that to Eve and him. What is this that thou hast done? And he knows exactly what it is, but he wants them to really look at and basically understand that you have done something very egregious. 
Now, those were questions, okay? It doesn't get much better in Genesis, okay? Because Adam and Eve have a son, and his name is Cain. Cain has issues. Cain has issues with Abel. And to make a long story short, remember, Cain kills Abel because of his own lack of sacrifice and relationship with God and was jealous of Abel all the way back in the garden. There was jealousy, there was anger, and there was murder. The murder of the innocent. Now we'll have to talk to God when we get up there and say, gosh, Abel, we don't read Abel doing anything wrong. We don't read Abel ever walking outside of God's will. As a matter of fact, the only thing we know about Abel, he made the proper sacrifice. But we also know God, who knows everything, sees everything, and is <clears throat> all-knowing about our own circumstances, allowed Cain to kill Abel. Wow. But nevertheless, God then comes. All right. And what does he do? God remembers, but he also what? He asks a question. Trying to salvage the situation, he asks a question. He says, where is thy brother? God didn't know where he was. Can you go where God isn't? Can you do something that God does not know about? God asked him the question the same way he asked his father a question, trying to hopefully that he would engage him in conversation, confess, and have relationship. But like his dad, Cain makes excuses and lies. So he says this, am I my brother's keeper? That was a mockery of God. And when we sin and don't confess, we mock God. And we make God less than who he says he is. And Cain is the perfect example of that. Now also, before we're coming to the end, you're just about there. We're just about there, okay? Now, listen, let's not run past this story before we see two or three things here. And then we're going to go on to the last example, and that will be the end. Cain killed Abel. Abel, the Bible said, had a righteous and a, an offering that pleased God. So we will never be able ever on this side to understand why God allows the innocent to be killed. But we've killed over 61 innocent babies that have done nothing. So it's something that began in the garden. And for whatever the reason and all of the reasons, because of a fallen world, God cannot rush in in every instance and save the innocence. And so innocence is vulnerable. It's up to mankind to protect until we get into another dimension and we're not there now. So that should be understood. God doesn't always rush in to save the innocence. What's the other thing? There was a space of time between the murder of Cain and the murder of Abel that Cain felt confident that he could have a discussion with God and God not, and God not be aware of it. So in other faiths, I know I was preaching this in California and a Iman before me said, well, we know, can you believe this is a true story too? Well, we know Cain killed Abel and then hid the body in a field long, well, long time before he had the conversation with God. Well, I don't read that in my Bible, so I don't preach that. But it was interesting he would say that before I got up to speak, I spoke after him. But this we do know. He felt confident God didn't know. He felt confident he had hidden his sin. And that's the way we are. 
okay? We feel confident that God doesn't really see us, that he really has overlooked us, and that our sin is not anything that is basically disturbing him. Cain felt the same way in his discussion with God. You didn't see that. I fooled you. There's not going to be any repercussions for this. Well, God let him know, don't you know that his blood cries out to me from the ground? Huh. I think your president, Donald J. Trump, understands that. But past presidents have not. There's no question. For every one of those innocent babies, there was bloodshed, and it cries out to God. It's one of the first lessons we learn in Genesis, that the shedding of innocent blood cries out to God. Cries out to God. And so Cain, the murderer, didn't realize that because he was not God. But God lets him know that that blood that you shed on the ground cries out to me. Also, we should recognize before, just before I'm about to close on this particular lesson, is that that space of time. There can be years between verses in Genesis, sometimes 10, 30, 40 years. So in other words, we don't really know how long it was before the time that God asked Cain, where is your brother? We don't know the length of time, but we know this. When innocent blood is shed, after a while, God's going to show up. After innocent blood is shed, after a while, God is going to show up and ask. Hopefully, we don't respond as Cain does, but we repent. And this nation repents. No? Let me go on here and prove my point. Isaiah 49 says, 14 16, but Zionist says, the Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. There it is again. Can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should not have compassion on the child of her womb? Yea, they may forget, but I will never forget you. God says to his creation, I am will never forget you. Now, watch this. We're just about there. Just about there. You read that. Uh, you read that with me. Matthew 10 and 30 says, but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Hmm. The very hairs of your head are numbered. I looked that up in the Hebrew and in, and in the Greek, and it means this. God actually took an instrument, you know, when you were made in secret, I was there. I knitted you together in your mother's womb. You ever read those songs? He said, I number the hairs of your head. It means actually to take an instrument and number each hair. I used to think that it meant God knew the number of my hairs on my head. Before this time and season, believe it or not, I used to have an afro. Okay. <laughs> but one day, as it is in life, I saw it thinning. And I said, Lord, you've numbered the hairs of my head. Then I said, well, which one is missing today? You actually know the number. <laughs> What's the point? I thought of that, thought it was funny. But then I went back and understood and said, you know something? He has numbered the hairs on our head prior to our birth. Prior to the birth. And I thought of all of the children that were aborted. Today, 61 million. Can I tell you something? 
I said, boy, you've numbered the hairs of their head. Immediately, I went back to my childhood and remembered getting a model car. And it took me almost a month to put that model car together. Some of you remember those cars. You buy them in the box and it's about a zillion pieces. Well, I'm not all that artistically inclined, but I said, I'm going to put that car together. And I pieced all the little pieces together. And I took the meticulous time to put each <laughs> hubcap on each light in its spot, the steering wheel and all of those things together. It took me about a, a good month. It's probably was more, I'll say a month. That's modern. What's my point? I came home from school one day and everyone has a little brother or a little sister. <laughs> it was crushed. When I walked into the room and saw my crushed car on the, <coughs> on the floor, my heart dropped. I became grieved and angry at the same time. Why? Because I remember each day it took me with the glue and the pieces to put that together so meticulously. I thought about that when I thought about the numbering of the hair, how God meticulously put us together how we're so fearfully and wonderfully made, far more than that model car. But then he watches an abortionist tear and dismember and kill his creation. And I think, I said, God, how can you even watch that? Then I remember he watched Cain kill Abel. God does not always rush in to save innocence. I felt that way over a model car. I can't imagine the grief he feels when he said, sees his creation dismembered, maimed, and abused and killed. I said to myself, Lord, You've numbered the hairs of my head. You've numbered the hairs of each one of those children. And then he came this, and that became the topic of this. He says, I have not forgotten one of them. I heard it clearly. And that's what birthed this lesson. And I began to go into thinking and my meditation afterwards. Over 61 million that we know about. I want you to know God has not forgotten one of them. Not one. He has not forgotten. Well, here's where I was going. <laughs> Psalm 9. And 14. If you want to take the time to get that, or you could just listen to me, I'm going to read it to you. Now, since I began, I was going here. But I wanted to lay that groundwork so you could understand. Are you ready? Psalm 9 and 14 says this. Declare among the peoples his doing. When he maketh inquisition when he maketh inquisition what is an inquisition when he begins to ask questions for blood just like he did in genesis declare amongst the people his doing when he maketh inquisition for blood what's to get what, what do you think the next verse word says he remembers them he forgetteth not the cry of the humble america as well as the world there's a day coming where god makes inquisition 
God will be asking questions, as he did with Cain, about the shedding of innocent blood. He says, I remember them. You may have forgotten. You may have thought they were insignificant. They were all fearfully, wonderfully made. I had numbered the hairs on their heads. I created them. I designed them. I brought them to birth. I remember them. And I forget not the cry of the humble. God remembers and God asks questions. And we're reaching a point where he will be doing just that with this nation and nations. God bless. Oh, uh, Reverend, my gosh. <laughs> My gosh, that uh, was heartbreaking. Um, um, you know, when it came to mind when you were talking was uh, when Lazarus, Lazarus died. Yes. And he wept. Yes. He, he wills himself to have these deep feelings. He's more human than we are. More than we realize. And he cried for him, and he resurrected him. But how about all these souls, all these innumerable numbers? I'm sure it's more than 61 million. Mm -hmm. And um, how he weeps for them. Well, the shocking thing about it is, uh, of course, you can't understand because you didn't have the experience. Maybe one day you will. He clearly spoke to my heart and said, I've not forgotten one of them. Even when I say it over again, you know, just... The, the, all, the, the awe of that because he's telling me he's watched every one of those children and he will not forget not one of those children and that each one weighs on him. Each one weighs on him. He says, I, I've not forgotten. So uh, not one of them. So uh, he didn't number the hairs of the head of just Christians. <laughs> He's numbered the hairs of the head of all of his creation. Uh, that's powerful. That's awesome. And, but yet he said the lessons. Well, and then he says, uh, more or less, you know, he comes to make a uh, psalm was, was written about a thousand years before Jesus. And Genesis was written at the beginning. And so, in other words, that theme still remains. Mm -hmm. Uh, he's going to make inquisition for blood. How he does it and how he goes about doing it, I don't know. I'm praying that this nation repents. I'm praying Roe versus Wade to be overturned. I'm praying that the states would then overturn their own individual laws. There would be a repentance because in those cases that he gave, that, that he shared with me, uh, they came to me, basically, they were unrepented. Ad, Adam was unrepented. Uh, Cain was unrepented. Um, he asked the questions so they would repent. He knew the answers. He knew exactly, but he wanted his children to say, I, I've done wrong, and he would cover that. And, um, this is why you, you have to be a pro-life activist. This is why you yeah. have to, because this day is coming. Because you could show them the truth and they're so hardened to it. And um, I think that that is why we're praying because it's not only to end abortion, mm -hmm. but to break the hardness in hearts yes. so that they'll see the truth so they'll have the opportunity to repent. Because when they see the truth for what it really is, this, and, and that's so true. And I know people say you can't legislate morality. That's mm -hmm. true. But Dr. King also said, but you can stop people from lynching me. <laughs> All right. So more or less, he was saying, well, you should have the law, but the hearts. What institution did God leave on the earth to deal with the hearts of men? The church, the church looks to government too much to do its job, to do what we're supposed to be doing. And so if we begin to do, I, you know, they're looking, some, a lot of the Christians looking for Trump to be the total answer. Trump is a part of the answer. God is never going to circumvent 
the institution he is designed to be the answer, and that is the church. And when the church really rises to the occasion, uh, I believe now, I think it's going to happen now, uh, that we would begin to really have the uh, hearts of the fathers turn towards the children mm -hmm. and the children so towards the, the fathers. And we would recognize that we have fallen mm -hmm. um, and we will get back to that place with God. Uh, we were founded on those principles. We were birthed on those principles and uh, they almost have been like eradicated. I think this is a window of opportunity for us. Yes. Uh, to to uh, regain what we've lost, you know, redeeming the time. I have a lot of hope that things could turn around. I see that um, like people who are big in the industry mm. have had conversions and yeah. in, in high places, and they've uh, told the truth, the searing truth, and um, they brought people you know, to a change of heart. And that's why I, I think that, you know, and people are praying and I always believe, you know, that God is on the side of the small, yeah. smallest army, the smallest kid, David against Goliath, the small little cloud that reigned, yeah. you know, that, that was able to, uh, and we're the small ones yeah. and we have to like keep on trudging forth and, you know, have that hope and belief and, and, uh, faith that God could do it. We yeah. have to let him do it. It's it's us knowingly, we have to know that he is going to do it and we have to ask him. Yes. One of the most uh, recited verses, I say it now more so, if my people, once again, uh, we're looking at sometimes the Congress or the governor or the Senate or even the president, but he said, if my people, which are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And the reason why this has come, he's saying, you need to turn from your wicked ways. Mm -hmm. He said, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive the sins okay. and I will heal the land. Mm -hmm. The shedding of innocent blood pollutes the land. Mm -hmm. That is our most egregious sin. Mm -hmm. And America has to repent over that 61 million or else I don't know what the repercussions for that are going to be. I've never seen it. I don't know what it would be, but I know even now, uh, un undoubtedly, we are reaping much uh, due to the fact that there is no sanctity of life in our, in our society. It is not heralded. It is not held in high esteem. It is not a priority. We don't believe in personhood. The, the, you know, there was a recent poll I think I shared here where 60% of the people of the church did not believe in the sacredness of, of life. That, that's a problem. That's a big problem. And I think that's what the Lord is going to open up. He's going to say, your heart is wrong, um, and we need to repent over that. And uh, redeeming the time, get back what you've lost over time, because we didn't know we weren't always there. We have acquiesced and fallen as a church, but as you stated, I would think it's going to be a change. And, you know, in these times we have uh, technology, mm -hmm. and technology does not equal religion, but it falls in the order of God, like math and science, all of this falls under the order of God to prove the truth. Like what, now that we have technology, we could see there's a spark that happens when the sperm and the egg meet together. Something wonderful happens, and why does it grow? Because it's, it's thriving for life. That's it's, even, you know, um, once again, uh, I've been shouting these things. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I think it was a five to four decision in 1973, but their bottom line uh, the, in their uh, <clears throat> reasons for uh, that particular vote is said, well, we do not know when life begins. Um, that's, I forgot the justice that wrote that in the synopsis or their uh summary on why indeed this particular law has passed, even though it was 5-4, it was close, but nevertheless it passed. And they said, because we don't know when life begins. Well, nothing more further than the truth now, because there's not a biology book in the world that will not say now, due to the technology, that life begins at conception. Mm -hmm. You know, with all the science, and it proves that. Basically, it is clear. I mean, you, it's irrefutable evidence. And I, and I said this. I, I got so 
nauseous after the Iraqi war because uh, so many people, Hillary, all the senators at that time said, well, if I'd have known what I know now, I would have not voted to go to Iraq, you know, because there were no weapons of mass destruction. Well, there's a weapon of mass destruction called abortion. Yeah. And now that you know that life begins at conception, will you change your vote now? Mm -hmm. And I remember Ruth Bader Ginsburg said no, because it's too much a part of our society now. That had nothing to do with it. The fact of the matter is, many of them said uh, on the Iraqi war, well, if I'd have known what I know now, I would have never voted to go into Iraq, okay? Because it is said, and I'm not going to get into that discussion, <laughs> there's mm -hmm. no weapons of mass destruction, okay? Uh, Colin Powell led us astray on that. So therefore, you know, I made a bad decision, but that's the same thing about abortion. Mm -hmm. they, we're not told all the information of what an abortion is. Many of these women go in not knowing that they're going to have uh, uh, psychological issues. They're going to have, they have a uh, war inside physiological them. issues. I mean, there's yeah. so much, mm -hmm. but right now you do now. The embryoscopy, one of the things that have been developed so wonderfully proves life begins at mm -hmm. conception. So now you have that information. Can we vi revisit Roe versus Wade? And people say, well, why did they say that? We don't know when life begins, because if you know when life begins, you have to honor the declaration that we hold these truths to be self-evident that all mankind was created equal, endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, meaning you can't take that right away that has been endowed by the creator to the child. Okay, mm -hmm. you can't take that away. Roe versus Wade took that away. So what do you have to say? Well, if that's okay, well, then we don't know when life begins. So if you don't know when life begins, the act of taking away something, we don't know if that's life. Mm -hmm. We don't know if that's when life began. That is not the case now. That is not the case now. So since you do now know it begins at conception, okay then the declaration uh, stands for them kicks to, in. Yeah. They're, they're in ground. Now, there's enough, you know, I think I, uh, I'm doing so many of these, but uh, the uh, Constitution, that was a declaration. We don't want, it says, we don't only want these rights for ourselves, but we want them for our posterity, mm -hmm. meaning our future children. So, at that point, well, that means any future children, if you're born on this terra firma, that means you, as soon as you're born, you have the, that, that right. So they're violating the Declaration and, and that portion in the, in the Constitution, which to me is quite clear. The Declaration it, of Independence and the Constitution it, all throughout is riddled with life. Yeah. All throughout a firm yeah, life and, yes. and the pursuit. Yeah. So, uh, as I often say, because it's pursuit, don't, I could be born poor. Mm -hmm. You don't have the right to take away my pursuit. If I don't make it, I don't make it. But not because you said exactly. I, I lived in the project or I lived on Skid Row or I lived here that I'm not going to make it. So I'm going to abort you. I'm protected because I have the right to pursue happiness. I have the right to pursue life. So. It's, they're wrong on so many accounts. It's unbelievable, but it's up to the people to say, listen, this is wrong. Um, there's people who profit from it. There's people who are politically, get, had political gains from it. So we have to expose it as an evil. And, um, but it has to Absolutely. really come from the church. It's not, it's not something that's out of ignorance mm -hmm. because you could, you could prove the truth. You could prove the truth and they could be informed and still make the same decisions. You mentioned Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. She had an admiration for Sanger. Mm -hmm. You know, she, wasn't she awarded to with a Sanger? Uh, award? I think that she, was Hillary, but, yeah, uh, but, but she might have been, I don't know. Uh, I think um, Ginsburg was actually in adoration and they have this kind of attitude. So it's already tainted. Mm -hmm. So it, it really requires more than just showing them the proofs, you know, they yeah. need a change of heart. That's yeah. all there and, is. And, and once again, there's only one 
institution that's been charged with changing men's and women's hearts, and that's the church. Amen. We're equipped to deal with the heart. We're the Congress, the Senate, the President, not necessarily maybe, but the church is designed to deal with the hearts of men and women, and we have been absent. We have not uh, taken that rightful place and really uh, shared uh, the gospel, the good news, um, and, and be bold about our own convictions. That will shift the culture. Yeah. Well, um, also, the technology could work on our behalf, too, because with people not acting on uh, very aggressively on the actions that were done in legislation, it, it brought in a massive brainwashing, mm -hmm. and all these people don't know the truth. And we, if we just blare it out through mass media in 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 all the social media and all that i know a lot of things are very hard to look at mm -hmm. but if you see a board of or board of babies yeah. you will say this is formed yes i mean at a very very young age how could you deny this now personhood get, now get your program in trouble but this is sometimes a battle in the pro-life arena mm -hmm. because there are pro-life entities uh, and uh, groups that don't want to show the pictures and that is absurd and i i know people frown on me saying that some but that is the most absurd thing that i could ever i've ever possibly heard when it comes to trying to expel an injustice or a social injustice right. the, the victim must be visualized right it's exhibit the, a uh, exhibit yeah. b exhibit yes. and, you know. that, and that must be very clear yes um and certainly i travel with the Center for Bioethical Reform. We partner together and going on college campuses is, is such a blessing because you see seniors who are in med <laughs> basically coming and say, <laughs> like pointing to them. I said, you know, no, they said never, never seen that. I've never, you know, and they're relating, they're talking. Some people are angry with us, but the greatest thing is when they come over and they're just railing and they believe bashing, more than they're bashing, <laughs> but then Some, through, discuss, through discussion, yeah, mm -hmm. through discussion, they say, you know something, you know, you're right. Um, why? But I'm, I'm talking while I have a picture, uh, you know, basically behind me of what abortion is. If you don't know what abortion is, you don't know why we're so vehemently against it. Mm -hmm. And you've been lied to. It's more than a clump of tissue and all these other things that they've tried to, to allude to. So um, we have to understand, uh, it, you know, especially I said to you, 21 days, uh, there's a heartbeat. Sometimes it's less than that I hear, but 20, I'll say 21, 42 days, brain waves, 82 days, child sucking their thumb. A lot of times the mother doesn't even know there's a child. Yeah. There. <laughs> I said, so what, what I said, you got to understand. And um, anyone who's watching this and doesn't agree, it may think we're a right wing zealots. Here's the difference between you and I is that I honestly believe that that's a baby. And I also believe that that child is sacred and that child is a human being. You cannot be a human being without being a person. And if you're a person, you're a human being. I believe that's a person. I believe it's a human being. So I am trying to defend their right. So you know, as you yelling and screaming and calling me names, I'm trying to tell you, I really believe that. And, you, and I say, you know what makes it worse? I said, science backs me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the biology backs me. And I said, I read my Bible. And it, it backs, backs you. me. <laughs> so, you know, what do you want me to do? Yeah. I said, because those that oppose me usually oppose me through ideology, mm -hmm. not sociological fact, not scientific fact, not not uh, certainly scripturally. So yes. I said, please understand. Um, there's no reason to get angry with me. You should understand why I believe, why I got like I believe. There was a time that um, when uh, I think it was in the 60s where parent, mothers were convinced that the formula was better than mother's milk mm. and it was an agenda because it was all for you know yes. money yes. and so a whole group of a whole layer of people started to believe that that their milk was not sufficient mm. 
Mm. And so, you know, we have to do the reverse lie. You know, we have to, I don't know, we, God has got to make it available for us since we have hearts to do it. Mm. You know, there's a lot of people out there that are pro-life. And, um, you know, if, if he gives us the creative means of getting to people really, really fast. Yes. And uh, well, now us. this medium you're using right now um, is unquestionably made it so that the mainstream lives do not take anchor and do not uh, control. control as much as prior mm -hmm. in prior generations. I mean, when I was coming up, Channel 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13 on <laughs> it was just coming into being. So anything that was said across there was like the truth, I mm -hmm. mean, but now you have, oh my goodness, you have all these means of access and all these things. And so therefore, uh, then you have the internet. So this is the information age, but uh, the mainstream, the, uh, the major channels, the, the major uh, sources for the news, unfortunately have become corrupt. And uh, that's very unfortunate. We ask our mainstream media to be fair, uh, to lay out both sides, and then let me objectively choose what I want to uh, believe and understand. But you have given both sides of the story equally. Nothing further from the truth today. They already have a narrative they want you to believe. They have, they have a set of uh, ideological points of views they want you to embrace and they are trying to shift the culture and it's anti-faith. I can't believe anybody, any Christian can't see that. Yeah, any pastor or priest or anyone who is conducting the faith, the Muslims, uh, they, they have to be able to see that this is the case. Mm -hmm. And um, we, you know, we as the church have to respond to this and say, these are lies. Um, we are called to deliver the truth. Our Lord says he's the way, the truth, and the life. And we have to share life. We can't share your lies or believe your lies, especially when your lies denounce our faith, mm -hmm. <laughs> deny, denounce the Judeo-Christian ethic. So we are in a struggle for the nation. Um, and it's getting into battle. Uh, violence. Violence is happening all over the land. No question. But I believe that's like the child is getting ready to come forth. Yeah. I think this is a travail. Um, and that's my personal opinion and my personal perception, spiritual perception. We, we just were not going to walk into um, the restoration and transition of this nation evil would fight against that. Obviously, mm -hmm. evil sees the seeds for it and is vehemently trying to crush those who would uh, carry forth this agenda that the president is bringing and that the church would like to once again to be restored and to bring. But evil sees the seeds for it, let's just say that. Mm -hmm. And they're fighting against it uh, right. as as nothing else I've ever seen in my in my personal life right. in my my tenure here on this earth Unhinged. Uh, <laughs> I, I've never seen never thought I would see by mm -hmm. the way I never thought I would see institutions that we depend on for our health and for our um, education basically turned against us as Christians turned against us as human beings as a people never thought that would happen mm -hmm. here but it has happened and you have a president that's trying to fight that he just recently today demanded the records from COVID from CDC because of the corruption that's in the CDC. Uh, it's a shame. It's a shame. Who would ever thought that? But uh, he released this from the World Health Organizations for very, very, very good reasons. And um, the nation has not enough people are catching it. But right now we're the nation and and i don't want to believe it either i didn't want to believe that but it but it is true i don't want to believe the horrors of vaccines to the degree that somebody would be deliberately attempting to utilize those things uh, in 2020 um you know tuskegee uh, uh, syphilis uh, incident with african americans happened and i think that was back in the 50s so uh but this is 2020 you almost have the very same thing happening again um the love of many as the scripture says has waxed cold and we um 
we're dis we're doing the sins of uh, of Noah. Um, the imagination of, of man's heart is continually evil. I mean, and that evil is to perpetuate their own greed and their own control. And they'll do anything for that. Unfortunately, and I have to say it, folks, the, the Democratic Party is is not the Democratic Party that I knew from the, se- from the 70s and from the early 80s. And it, it was about then that's when it began to really take wind. It, it always had problems, <laughs> but nothing that I'm seeing today is totally consumed, totally. And I'm praying that uh, I never want to be in a nation of one party because it's just absolute power corrupts Mm -hmm. and uh, we need to hold each other accountable. And but right now, how can you embrace that platform, the platform that is totally detrimental to the church and detrimental to society? So we're in a struggle. This is a silent coup. It's not with tanks and guns and planes, but it's going on. Most people don't know it, uh, but we need to recognize that uh, the people of faith have to rise up. And the major issue, what this, the big door evil has opened to this country is abortion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to what I was given when this began on March 13th, it's... Um, two months now, over two months, uh, I was given to do this because God wants to bless us. Mm -hmm. And we have to come into prayer as one nation and people know it. People agree with pro-life, but they're not, they're not coming together. Um, he, you know, so we have to come as one family, one, one children of one God and one father. And, and, (laughs) but, um, I think what has happened is that me meeting you what has god been doing over this time of quarantine i just yeah i just realized this is when i sat down here that noah spent 150 days in the ark Mm -hmm. well march 15th is about the time when this started more april may june and it's july 15 16 which is about five months and then you know it's time to to take the land (laughs) that's what noah did but a lot of that, uh, this quarantine, a lot of good things have happened. And uh, values were reset. A lot yes. of things were reset. And uh, you got the commission to do this. Yes. And so that's something that's happened out of the crisis. Might not have happened uh, if there wasn't a crisis or the, the certainly the necessity thereof. And people are looking for other avenues, especially people spending more time home and on the computer. And hopefully they find programming such as this that is helping them understand times and seasons and and is increasing their faith, which we desperately need uh, right now. Yes. All all people have to do, even if they don't believe in this, like pro-life or they don't know, if they just say, Lord, show me the truth, because... For one who seeks the truth, God will show them the truth. Yes. And it has to be with the heart. And, um, you know, and that's the only reason why I came to see that Trump, you know, is mm-hmm. fighting for what God, you know, there's so many prophecies. Yes. And it's not just Protestant. It's not just Jewish. It's Catholic. You know, You're it's right. all around. And, you know, that that's what came to me. And I was like, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. You know, because you cannot read a book by its covers. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know. Usually people say, oh, that's a sinful man, you know, or, you know, he's too outspoken or whatever it is. But God will use us for whatever he wants to, you know, in our time. Interesting enough, I think once again in the crisis, it's and this current crisis of culture in the country has brought uh, the denominations uh, the, the, the remnant of the denominations together. together. Um, my pastor. You know, we used to say there's three things that will bring you together, common enemy, common goal, and a common God. Mm. And we have a common God. Mm. We have a common goal. Mm. Okay. And uh, there's no doubt we're seeing that we all have a common enemy. <laughs> so we are being um, the, uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic, uh, the people of faith are being uh, persecuted. To, yes. uh, to no end, which has uh, drawn me to be with uh, Father Joseph and mm-hmm. others and uh, Chris Flaherty and uh, across denominational 
lines. I was with Pastor Grove. He's the, he's the Baptist church down the street. And then there's the evangelicals with uh, Pastor Bill Delvin out there in, in Philadelphia. I mean, we, we all go through different denominations. And then there's the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the Assemblies of, of God uh, that we uh, affiliate. And so to Peggy, I couldn't remember her name, but Peggy uh, works there at the uh, church in Scotch Plains. I can't come think of that name right now, but uh, uh, Evangel Church at Scotch Plains, and she is uh, pro-life and does work in, in the high schools, and she sits on the Life Net board. So, but those are different denominations, different, you know, we're all coming together because yes. we realize the, the enemy is raging, and, it, and we're the only ones that have the ability to suppress the rage of satanic powers. Right. And that's exactly what it's being. God uh, unifies uh, us. Yes. You know, and I, I think that uh, at the end of all this, when abortion is finished with, and I speak in faith, because in I. Second term, I believe so. Yes. <laughs> when this happens, we're, we're going to see each other uh, differently. We're going to have a more uniform, unified. Um, there, There's going to be such a togetherness because, you know. I, I think God is showing us. No, there's no silver bullet. Yeah. There's no denomination with a silver bullet. I think we need each other. We need each other. And uh, I think yeah. that's what is uh, going to be the beauty of this new era, this new age. And yeah. uh, oh, we would let uh, July 4th, uh, I went to St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church to have an ecumenical prayer service. Yeah. Uh, the Baptist preacher, me, well, I, they call me Baptist. I'm more free free spirit <laughs> so i tell people my story they say well that's really i said yes it happens so it's you can never level it to a denomination i'm not here to tell that story but but look i will tell you this the the most impact on my life was full machine mm. okay so that's uh. what, what once again but you know we had the uh, different we had at least six or seven different denominations at that service it was a great we fellowship, we came together. Why did we come together? Because of the slaughter of the innocent. And why do we feel we need to pray? Because we know that uh, it could be this one cometh out, but by prayer and fasting, we have to pray. We have to be unified together. We have to, uh, you know, lift our voices in harmony. And God loves unity, you know. Okay. So uh, he uh, und undoubtedly will uh, respond to like, services because he wants his children uh, just as any parent he wants his children to get along <laughs> amen 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 <laughs> yes well i thank you and i um welcome you the next time you come <laughs> not a problem thank not you problem. so much thank yeah. you so much reverend god bless you god bless you thank you bye everybody see you tomorrow bring your friends bring your family we need to pray together <laughs>